Good evening. Good evening, sir. So <laughs> this is the advantage of working for a software company all my life. At least I know how to get it in both the places. So um, first of all, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. Uh, no, sir. Yes, sir. No? Yes, sir. All right, so um, that was a very long and uh, long-winded introduction, I guess. But uh, one thing which they didn't know, because it was not on my profile, was that as a part of uh, my consulting assignments when I was doing some work uh, on my own. Um, I was uh, with Dr. Oak and uh, did a lot of work for when he was on the other side as a client and we have known each other for a very long time. So it was a very pleasant surprise to see him here today. I, he kept it a very guarded secret that he's going to be here. So anyway, so it's uh, nice to be back. Uh, I was here about a year and a half ago uh, in the same auditorium and uh, talked about a few things. So today, uh, you know, what I thought I would do is, uh, I understand that most of you are from uh, the new batch. Uh, yes, sir. Maybe some seniors will walk in, I was told. Uh, but uh, the idea was, uh, I, I just wanted to share some of my experiences uh, based on, you know, a long career that I've had. And hopefully some of them will strike a chord and of course we can have questions and answers after that. So feel free to ask questions anytime. But before I do that, uh, just wanted to tell you what we do uh, as uh, my company is called All Scripts. So we are um, one of the largest uh, providers of software for hospitals and doctors, and mostly in the U.S. But we are also in the international markets. Uh, you know, we can see about 180,000 doctors in the U.S. use our software, which is you know, roughly one in three doctors in the U.S. actually use our software. 1,500 hospitals, and so on and so forth. So that's, uh, that's about the company. Now, this is not going to be advice. This is based on uh, you know, uh, just some experiences that I've had and some common themes from some great people's advice uh, with, to people like you. All right? And the, what you see here is more of to remind me what I'm going to talk about. So don't, you know, th there's nothing much that you can uh, see there, but uh, it's more for me. All right. So first thing, um, you know, people, just yesterday, uh, I had a nephew of mine who was about to get into engineering, and uh, you know, he was asking me, what should I do? Which branch should I take? Uh, you know, should I take a, a better college or a better branch? And so on and so forth. And this is a question which comes up you know, every year. Uh, the only the people are different. Uh, there are uh, situations where People talk about, well, should, I, should I go with this career or that career? Some of you would be wondering right now, OK, after I finish my MBA, what should I be doing? Right? And a lot of times, uh, the, some, somebody says that, look, it is, uh, you know, I think this, is, this particular field is going to have better prospects. I'll get better jobs. Right? Now, that seems to be how most people make up their minds. My, my experience tells me that that's the wrong way of doing it. Uh, because you don't know what is going to happen in the future. And I'll quote an, a personal example. So when I did my MBA from Ahmedabad uh, way back 31 years ago, at that time uh, I you know, could have got into almost any job. So you know, the, the coveted jobs in those days were you know, Tata Administrative Services, Hindustan Lever, it was not called Hindustan Unilever in those days, you know, and all these uh, uh, multinationals where you would either be in administrative services or you would be selling soap or toothpaste, right? And uh, for me, I, I never wanted to get into any of those jobs. And I wanted to make computers were my passion. In those days, computers were very uh, young, PCs were yet to be uh, you know, we had to see the Indian market, and uh, but I said no. I, this is what I love doing, so I will go there. So not only my fellow uh, students, my friends, but also the professors at, at the institute, they all told me that you are being stupid. You know, because in those days, believe it or not, IT 
was uh, considered only a support function in any company. Uh, Dr. Oak uh, also was uh, handling that kind of a role where you basically work for supporting the management in terms of uh, the MIS or it also the other term which was used in those was EDP, electronic data process. And they said, you know, don't get into this thing because it's, you'll never go very far, you'll never become the CEO, you will, uh, you know, stagnate, etc., etc. So I thought about it and I said, uh, well, that's what I enjoy doing. So it's okay, you know, if I get a little lower money, if I, you know, don't have that much mobility, I would rather do that because that's where I think I'll be happy. So I did that. I, I came to Pune. I took up my first job with an uh, engineering company called Valchand Nagar Industries. And uh, everybody actually ridiculed me for doing that. Uh, the salary that I got, actually, I must tell you that you might laugh at it, but my first job offer after three unsuccessful interviews in Pune, I wanted to be in Pune, by the way. So my first job offer was 800 rupees a month. That was after doing IIT and I. And uh, when I said, you know, I had put my expectation. By the way, I was also married by then, so I had to support uh, family. So I, I definitely needed some money. So while money was not the major motivator, at least I had to, you know, uh, earn for myself and my wife. So I said, you know, this is, I had said that my expectation is a little more than that. So they said, what, what the hell do you know? You, you know nothing. You are just, you, you, we are going to teach you everything. But anyway, so I didn't take that job. So I finally got this job with Valchandaga Industries, which was giving me a princely salary of about 2,000 rupees a month, uh, which I thought was great salary. Uh, you know, I thought, you know, I made it. Uh, other people who joined other companies, multinational companies, got at least four to five times that, or maybe more, right? And, but I never regretted that. And then, guess what? After 10 years of being in that field, Suddenly the IT revolution happened, 10 or maybe 12 years, something like that. And then I had all my classmates who had gone into various functions coming to me and saying, IT mein kaise ghusne ka hai? How, tell me how, how do I get into this IT? Because that was the new rising sun. So what you think today is as, as maybe the, the most attractive profession, if you don't enjoy it, you never know whether that will remain attractive after a few years. IT is a good example, you know. People are saying, some people are saying, I don't know whether it's true or not, that within about three or four years, this whole glamour about IT and all that will be gone, right? So one never knows, and this is a, all a cyclical thing. So the, what, what can you do then? Nobody can predict the future. So my advice to you, based on my experience is, go with your passion. Even if it doesn't become the most attractive uh, career, at least you're enjoying what you're doing. You're not going to office every day thinking, oh my God, ye kya kar raha hai So that's, that's, that's one of the things which I learned, you know, fortunately it worked out for me. Um, second thing was again, you know, about being in India. Um, it's very funny, but of my class in IIT, which was, you know, whatever, the small class was about 50 people, I have more classmates in the Bay Area in San, near San Francisco than I have anywhere else in the world, including in India. Because that was the done thing. You know, you did your IIT, you got a scholarship, you went to some US university and you stayed there. Right? But I had always made up my mind that, no, I want to be in India. Now, there's nothing right or wrong about it. I'm not trying to say that this is better or that is better. But the point is, people will put all kinds of pressures on you. So I, I told you that I was uh, married by the time I uh, finished my MBA. And uh, the interesting story is that uh, you know before we were to be married, um, two days before that, they had invited me over to my wife's uh, place, and all their relatives had come, all the you know seniors from various places they had come to for the wedding, and I was supposed to be introduced to them. And one by one, they started asking me. You know, you are from IIT, you are doing your MBA, you should be going to the US. So I said, no, no, I don't want to do that, I want to be here. So they each started convincing me, because all their kids were all in the US. All of them. Nobody had any kids in India. So they tried to, you know, convince me. And after about 
you know, I was being polite because, you know, after all, I was going to get married two days later to, you know, their uh, granddaughter or grandniece or whatever. And I, I tried being polite for quite some time. And finally, after half an hour, I, I lost patience. I said, let's, let me understand one thing. Is my going to the US a precondition for this wedding? Because if so, then this wedding is off. No, 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 no that's not what you are saying, etc. But anyway, so, so the wedding happened. Fortunately, you know, it's, we've had, uh, what, 32 years, more than that, of uh, wedded life. And uh, everything has been fine. And today, or why just today, I've always thought that if I look at did I miss out something? That was what I wanted to do. Did I miss out something by not going to the US? I can you know, tell you at least from my own perspective that if I was to compare myself with the average batchmate who went to the US, if you convert the dollars to rupees, obviously you know, they will make more money. But if you look at it from even from a purchasing power parity angle, forget you know, the everything else about family and you know, culture and you know, everything else that goes along with it. But even if you were to look at just from a purchasing power parity angle, I think I've done much better than most people that went about. So again, that was my passion. That is what I wanted to do. It's, it's a myth that when people say that, you know, you can make money only if you go abroad or only if you do a certain kind of a job. So that's something which, again, where my passion really helped. Um, another example I'll give you about the passion part. Uh, I had a, another nephew who was, was absolutely brilliant. He's, he topped in the engineering college. He was a civil engineer. And he was also very good in computers. Okay? And um, he got a job uh, during placement from one of the large civil engineering companies in Delhi. And uh, one of the topmost IT companies in India, in Bangalore. And this guy was in a fix because he liked computers. He was very good in civil engineering. And he asked me, saying, you know, what should I do? Where, where do you think my career will be better? So if, I, if you were in this situation, raise your hand. You know, this is about three years ago. So IT was still doing pretty good. OK? Raise your hand if you. If you think you would go for, you are a civil engineer, you are good in computers, you have got a job with the best IT company and the best civil engineering company, where would you go? Raise your hand. Civil, civil engineering, raise your hand. About half. And I presume, let, let me ask anywhere, how many of you would go to IT if you are in that situation? About half and half, right? So is there a logic to that? What do you think is the? Why did you, whoever said, said civil engineering, why, why civil engineering? <laughs> Just louder, a little bit louder. Okay, infrastructure keeps growing every year, so you think that, you know, that will be a better career. Somebody from IT, somebody who said IT, why? Anyone stand up? Yeah? If I, if I could have chosen the civil engineering, it would have been a field job. But in IT, you know, if you have to shake on, uh, sit on the machine. <laughs> <laughs> so is it good or bad? Do you think it's good or bad? <laughs> okay, out of interest. So yeah, absolutely. So civil engineering typically you would stand in the hot sun, uh, possibly you know in the field, in remote places, with uh, you know no comforts and so on. An IT company will probably, you know, sit in a air-conditioned office the whole day, etc., etc. Uh, who knows, money-wise, this might be a bit better, that might be better. So, what do you think my advice would be? It doesn't matter. My advice was, my advice was, what is your passion? What do you think you'll enjoy more? Right? Same theme that I'm talking about. If you think you're going to enjoy doing civil work more, it doesn't matter if you think that IT will be a pushier job, it will, it will give me a way to go abroad, it will give me more money. Forget all that. 
you will be good at if you're if you're really enjoying your work, you will you'll excel in civil engineering and you'll do well. That's what he did ultimately, and he's extremely happy. He's, it so happens that now he's actually using his computer knowledge to really do wonderful things in civil engineering. So that is icing on the cake. All right, so that was another example. The other thing which I, I really believe strongly in is uh, it's very easy for us to become cynical or start doubting people, mistrusting people. You know, all of us, if you have not already gone through that, some, some events will happen in life where, you know, you feel, you know, something is, some, somebody has betrayed your trust. So I, I also went through a, you know, partnership where I thought everything was hunky dory and uh, unfortunately things didn't work out, you know, I think my partners, you know, were unfair to me. I'm sure they think I was unfair to them because that's always the way it, it goes, right? Um, so, uh, for some time, I was kind of, you know, devastated. It's very easy to start doubting everybody. You know, that people, you know, people are out to get you, people don't want to give you your dues. Uh, it's very easy to become cynical. But that's the worst thing you can do. And why I'm saying this is, you're all young and maybe you haven't had the opportunity or the misfortune of uh, going through something like this. But Believe me, everybody has to go through some hardships of this kind in your life. The important thing to remember is not to lose faith. Even if you get some bad experiences like this, it's, uh, it's the wrong thing to lose faith. So even today, when I talk about you know, these people with whom, with whom I had disagreements and a very bitter uh, separation and all that, even today when somebody asks me, you know, who do you think is the best salesperson you have worked with? Without any doubt, it was the person I had the most disagreement. So everybody has their own, you know, good qualities. Sometimes people don't see eye to eye. Uh, I've had uh, at least two or three experiences where I've known couples, husband and wife, both have been very good friends, both have been wonderful people, and they've gone through a divorce. And for Nuts, I cannot imagine why such nice people cannot get along with each other. Well, we don't need to know. There might be something between them which, you know, it's not good for us to know. But does that make either one of them a bad person? Absolutely not. So I think this is another lesson that I've learned. And, you know, it, by and large, if you, if you trust people, if you, if, you, if you have faith in people, they will reciprocate positively. So this is something which I, I strongly believe in. It's uh, never, never take one example where something went wrong with somebody and either categorize that person as a black person or worse, don't try and uh, generalize that saying that, you know, people should not be trusted. Which is uh, similar, which is uh, the first, uh, something similar to what I was just saying. You know, you always hear this saying about is the glass half full or half empty, right? So the biggest thing, favor that you can do to yourself is always look at the glass being half full and not half empty. So I'll give you some examples of that again from my personal life. So I told you already about the partnership breakup. But guess what? I was devastated. I thought I had given you know, a few years of my life, at, you know, I'd thrown away a good job, I had gone into this with great hopes, and, you know, the moment the company started doing well, I thought I was being cheated. And, you know, I came out with nothing, absolutely nothing to show for those years that I had spent with, you know, all the hard toys that I had done. But guess what? That which I had actually learned in those few years, actually was the reason why I could set up my own company after that and why I could actually you know, do so much better, including selling software in the US on my own uh, with, a, with a few other partners and so on. And I would never have imagined doing that, even imagined doing that, had it not been for this earlier partnership which broke up. So full credit I have to give to that bitter experience for making me who I am today, right? So 
what sometimes you think as a very disastrous situation, as something which you feel that, oh my God, you know, I've really lost everything in life and I really, you know, screwed up or you know, people cheated me and so on. That could be the best thing that happened to you when you look back in retrospect. And sometimes, you know, some, for people as young as you are, it might be hard to imagine how this can happen. But believe me, I mean, I, I've read multiple stories, of course, and later I will show you some other people who have said the same thing. But this is something which I sincerely believe that, uh, you know, it's important. So I'll, uh, a quick story, I, and some of you might have heard of this story. There's, there's this little boy, and, uh, you know, he found a, an egg of a bird. A bird used to come and there was a nest and he found an egg of a bird. And uh, he took that egg and, you know, kept it inside and he was eagerly waiting for the bird to hatch. The egg to hatch and the bird to come out. And uh, we waited for a few days and he found one day that, you know, there's something happening, there's little cracks there, etc. And he could see that the bird was struggling to come out. That little chick was trying to come out. And it was really struggling and it was not being able to break the egg and come out. So this guy said, you know, what a poor thing. So he kind of helped by breaking the egg open so that the bird could come out. The bird came out and you know, he was very happy and now he was waiting eagerly to see the bird fly, grow and fly. And he waited and he waited and he waited and the bird was growing but it wasn't flying. So he got really worried. So he went to his veterinarian and asked him, you know, why isn't this bird flying? So the vet examined the bird and, you know, looked at all the things and, the, and he said, you know, strange, you know, there seems to be nothing wrong with the bird. But apparently. So tell me, how did you find this bird? Where did you find it, etc. So he told him the whole story. He said, ah, that's the problem. So he said, what is the problem? He said, nature's way of making sure that the bird has enough strength in its wings is to, that happens when it tries to break the egg. That is what builds up the wings muscles. And since you did not allow it to actually exercise that during the time it was hatching, it will never fly now. So see the moral of the story, that quite often nature has a way of putting you through some apparent hardship which seems unsurmountable, but only if you go through that, you become capable of handling something much bigger later. And that's the kind of example that I was quoting from my personal life. Another similar example, um, I was working for a company. Uh, and you know what all companies I work with, so I won't elaborate the name, but I, you know, for a change, uh, normally I've had very good uh, relations with my managers and my bosses and so on, but in this one particular case, somehow the chemistry was just not matching, right? And one, after struggling for quite some time, you know, I came to the same conclusion, my boss came to the same conclusion that this is not going to work out. And he basically told me, you know, you need to buzz off. If it's not working, and you need to find a exit. So I said, good, because you know this is the best thing I've heard. Because I'm not happy doing whatever I'm doing. It's just not working. But let's make sure that I plan it out. Let's plan how I'm going to exit, how the org structure is going to look when I'm not there. Let's agree on it, and then I will be off. I did that. I came out. and. For some time again, you know, similarly, I said, oh my God, what a failure, right? How, how did I mess up so badly? But today, after that, I would have never thought of, you know, otherwise getting into a role like what I'm doing today. But because I was kind of forced out of this position due to, you know, disagreement with the manager or my boss, that made me think as to, okay, so what is it that you know, I like doing within the kind of a corporate setup? And I landed into a position with BMC Software and then here, 
and I've never been happier doing the kind of job that I'm doing. Now, had it not been for this disagreement and this, you know, party, I would have never got into this position. And obviously, it was a much, much better role than I could have ever imagined. So again, uh, sometimes, you know, we have to also get, uh, tell people to go uh, because this is not a good enough fit culturally or from a skill set angle, etc. And this is what I keep telling them, that this might actually be a blessing in disguise for you. Not many people believe me when I tell them that at that point, because obviously, you know, you are really uh, crestfallen when somebody is telling you that it's not working out. But remember, again, that this, this could be the best thing that happened to you later. And you will come back and learn from it. Okay, so another sort of learning that I have had. Um, you know, you have some very good teachers, and I'm sure they'll teach you a lot. But particularly in an environment like this, uh, you can learn much more from each other than from your teachers. And that's something which I sincerely believe in. The one, uh, the best student, my very close friend of mine, the best student from IIT, uh, he, I remember still, in the very first year we had this uh, English uh, class, okay? On compulsory course was English in the first year. Those are the five year engineering days. So, you know, the first year was kind of very basic English, physics, chemistry, and so on. So, we had the semester end exam. And this guy was, we, we walked into the auditorium much, much bigger than this, okay? And everybody was supposed to sit for the exams there. And he, he said, hey, can, you, can you tell me who our English teacher is? I said, what? This is the end of the semester. You don't know who the English teacher is? He said, I never attended a single lecture. So I was very surprised. You know, why did now, of course, remember that in, in that particular institution, attendance was not compulsory. Meaning, it was, so the rules you have to remember, the rules may be different in every place, but in that case, attendance was not compulsory. And then I discovered that every day, later I found out, that every day he used to come with us to the, from the hostel to the college, and we would go towards the department, and he would take a left turn and go to the library. 8.30 our lectures used to start, we used to finish I think at 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock again, he would come back with us. Full 8.30 to 1, he would never go to a single lecture. He would only go and sit in the library. And then he would discuss in the hostel, and he would actually teach us, and he would you know, explain to us what he had learned and so on. And the guy was a, almost a topper. And later I realized that he, he figured out how he can make best use of that time. Now that doesn't work for everybody. It would not work for me, for example. Okay, so don't, don't uh, try, don't, don't imagine that I'm telling you to bunk classes. Uh, it's, you know, it takes a special kind of a person to be able to do that. But then when we are talking about all this later, we realize that we used to learn much more from each other and each other's interpretation and understanding and all of that than in what any, any teacher could teach in the class. So this is an opportunity. It's not just in the classroom or while you are students, but that goes on through life. What happens is sometimes people kind of get into a feeling that, okay, I know this. I know best or I know what the solution to this is, etc. Usually, particularly when it's not a mathematical problem, in real life situations, there are always not just two points of view but multiple points of view. And being able to understand, being able to appreciate, have a healthy debate, not that I am right and you are wrong, not to prove a point that you are, I am better than you. But when you have this kind of a healthy debate, you can learn so much more than what any textbook can teach you. So I think you, you know, this is another sincere advice to you that if you could really leverage the fact that so many of you are together and you know, were learning together, you should really uh, use that uh, to your advantage. So whether it was my graduation days or post-graduation days, it was always the best thing that I remember uh, even today. In fact, uh, there was a survey which was done last year or two years ago about uh, IIT education. And they interviewed a whole bunch of 
students who have finished uh, their graduation from IITs. And to their horror, they found that unlike what they thought, they did, nobody actually gave credit to their success, whatever they were doing today, to the specific teaching in the classrooms in IIT. But they all credited their success to what they learned from each other in the hostels, in the classrooms, in the debates, and so on. The same thing when I was doing my MBA. Uh, our, our methodology was, I don't know what the methodology is here, but our methodology was purely a case method of uh, discussion. So they, we didn't have, we did, nobody taught us anything. You're supposed to learn the theory on your own, study it before and then you come and discuss a case and you apply. And everything was through debates. And the teacher's job sort of guide the debate towards a logical conclusion and you know if there are some fallacies then point them out and basically be a facilitator rather than a teacher. And that again was probably the best thing that I could have learned and also learned that in real life cases, particularly for management students, usually there's no right and wrong answer. And what is right, what is wrong is dependent on so many other things, including sometimes things like what would be acceptable. You know, we, we often make fun of uh, politi politicians. But we have to realize that politicians have one great ability. They can take masses together. And very few intellectuals like us can do that. So uh, to give you some of you who know Magar Patta city in Pune, that's an example of how uh, you know, something which normally what, what happens the way the city develops is, you know, outskirts like this, this area for example. As the city grows, the land becomes more and more valuable and builders come and, you know, start buying parcels of land. Some farmer will say, okay, I'll sell whatever, you know, one fourth of an acre out of my two acres and somebody else will sell something and that's how the whole thing goes. And they sell it off, they make, you know, whatever, depending on what stage of development it is in, they might make a few lakh rupees and before you know it, those few lakh of rupees are gone some in some cars and some trips and some something and some bad habits and so on and so forth. And they are back to square one with not even having the land left now to cultivate. And this is a story which has been unfolding again and again and again across various cities in India. And actually, this is a you know international phenomenon. So in this case, Magarpatta city case, the, that whole land belonged to family. Uh, you know, Magar was the sort of family name, and lots of families were oh, each owning some pieces of land. And a, a famous politician, again, I won't name. You know, those of you who are from Pune know it. Um, so he actually said, look, what, instead of selling off your land, why don't you guys come together, pick somebody who's a good you know, somebody who understands construction business, you pool the land, let this person develop it into a township, I will help you with, you know, connecting you to the financial institution and whatever, etc. You have the most in important thing which is the land. And you will not sell the land. You will actually contribute that land and to that extent you will become shareholders in this company. And then that company will own this whole property, the development. And then forever after, you and your generations after you will actually reap the benefits of that. That's what Magarpatta city is. And that's how it, it has been actually now studied by various management schools and you know, international and national. And you know, it's, it's touted as an example of the most successful township anywhere in the world. Now, wouldn't have been possible unless all these people would have been brought together by a politician who, who could understand how to deal with conflicts, how to get different points of view and bring them to a consensus, very, very important when it comes to any, anything that you do in life, right? <coughs> so the point is social skills, this is one example of social skills, are probably as important as your IQ, your, you know, whether you know your with its financial management, with its HR management, HR management particularly, you know, the soft skills are the most important ones. 
In fact, I still remember when I was in uh, doing my MBA, I was fresh out of college, went from IIT, which was completely sort of quantitative dominated, the very, very, you know, black and white kind of a uh, regime, to an MBA school where it was, you know, differences were, differences were to be accepted, there were no right or wrong solutions and so on. And I used to have a very healthy or unhealthy, depending on how you look at it, disregard for anything which was the soft sciences, which is like HR, organization behavior. I used to you know, sneeze at them. I never took a single course in my second year in those topics because I thought, this is common sense. Why, do you have, why does somebody have to teach that? What is there to learn in that? That was my ignorant belief. Later, when I went into management positions and you know, as I went through my career, I realized that the most that I learned during those two, in spite of not taking those courses, was actually the social sciences. And that was probably the social skills was the ones which were most important when for being successful in life. You know, operational research, you know, linear programming and integer programming. Excel can do that for you if you know how to formulate the problem. But Excel cannot tell you how to deal with a human conflict. And that's w where I learned uh, that, that that's most important. In fact, uh, there's a book, and uh, you might have read it, or at, at least if you have not read it, you should read it, by Malcolm Gladwell called Blink. Outliers. Blink, of course, and you know there's several other books, but Outliers is one book, again, which I highly recommend. And in that, he has shown examples where he has identified several uh, several attributes of how people became absolutely great, like right from Beatles to Bill Gates and so on. These are the examples that he quotes. And he kind of researched them and tried to find out what, what was so special about these people. Why did they outshine everybody else? And one of the things that was a common theme in his research was that not only they had, of course you have to have a reasonable level of intelligence, there's no doubt about that. But within that, does everybody with high intelligence become successful? Quite to the contrary. In fact, very high intelligence people sometimes are total misfits in, in the society. And he found that EQ or social skills probably is much more important than just IQ. Yes, you need to have a good IQ, reasonable IQ, but you need to have much better social skills. So again, take this as an opportunity to polish and Exercise your social skills. You have that opportunity right here when you are doing this, this course. You know, this is something which you will not learn necessarily in the class. But you can definitely learn as you go along. There were two other things that he talked about actually, so which is also important. So while that was not the topic of this, but I will uh, tell you that he also found out that you know he these people it was not an accident that they, they became so good. Typically, the theory that Malcolm Gladwell puts across is to really be a master of something, to really excel at something, you need to work, the magic number is 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours if you practice something, you can be great at it. That is the theory that he has. So, then people say, well, you know, when did the Beatles practice 10,000 hours or when did Bill Gates you know, do programming for 10,000 hours. And he has shown through the history that actually that did happen and it was not an accident that they became so good at whatever they were doing. Or he takes examples of others like Michael Jordan in basketball and so on and so forth. So if you think about it, a typical working year, you know, if you work about it as a day and, you know, with normal holidays and so on and so forth, a typical working year in, in let's say corporate life is 2,000 hours. So 10,000 hours to give a context to what, what we are talking about is like five years of experience. Now some people can do it in two years by really slogging, working through the night and you know, really practicing at all times and so on. But that's what, so you have two years in front of you. <laughs> you can translate it to 10,000 hours and really excel at what you're doing. And of course, having said all that, it doesn't mean that anybody who with a good IQ, good EQ, and 10,000 hours of practice can become absolutely the greatest in the world. You also need some lucky breaks. 
So you did say that there are some lucky breaks, but then that's not something in your control. Right? So that, that is something which you can live with. All right. So this is, uh, I won't uh, you know, go through the whole thing, but this is Steve Jobs. All of you know who Steve Jobs is and unfortunately passed away. And uh, he actually gave this address at Stanford, somewhat similar to, you know, it was of course a valedictory address, which means that people who are uh, going out of the college after that. And I'll just read it for you because this may not be very readable, I'm not sure. But some excerpts which really struck a chord. You can't connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect them looking backwards. <coughs> See, they also say, there's a famous saying, um, you know what 2020 vision is? 2020 vision means perfect eyesight. Okay, in India they call it 6 by 6 because we measure in meters, Americans still talk in feet. So 2020 is, you know, you can see at 20 feet perfectly. So they say hindsight is always 2020. Right? Hindsight is always 2020, which means you can always look back and figure out exactly how it should be. And that's also what he says, you can't connect dots looking forward, you can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, your destiny, life, karma, whatever. This approach has never let me down, it has made all the difference in my life. This is Steve Jobs saying, which kind of resonated with me because I also had similar experiences which I talked to you about earlier. Right? So you, you they later realize that things which apparently had did not make sense to you or actually you thought were disastrous were really what really made you what you are. He says, I'm pretty sure none of this would have happened if I hadn't been fired from Apple. Sounds similar to my firing from that company. It was awful tasting medicine, but I guess the patient needed it, right? So sometimes you need to have bitter medicine to get well. Sometimes life hits you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. That's passion, what I was talking about earlier. You've got to find what you love. Right? By the way, I mean, in case you are wondering, I, I thought about what I went through and then later I was looking for, I said, my saying it I may not sound impressive enough, so let me see what others are saying and luckily I found this. So I was very happy to find that at least there's something which I also agree the same thing. Okay, then your time is limited, so don't waste it living somebody else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the result of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow always know, already know what you truly want to become. Everything is a secondary. This is Steve Jobs, who you all know, you know, couldn't have had a more sort of, you know, up and down career and one of the legends of our life. Right? And finally, unfortunately, he had cancer and died. Bill Gates, he was a dropout from Harvard, as many of you know, right? He again, he actually went and spoke at Harvard, 